everybody, it's Safi and Marco dishing on the movies today. We're reviewing a movie called The Oblong Box that was uh, put out in 1969. The Oblong Box originally was a story written by Edgar Allan Poe, but truthfully the movie we're going to review today is nothing like the actual story except for in both stories, the oblong box refers to a coffin. This movie is about two brothers. Just a minute here. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry. I think we need to put Safi in an go, oblong box. Who go to Africa. One brother, Julian Vincent Price, accidentally kills a young native boy. But his brother, Sir Edward, Alastair Williamson, is blamed for it. The boy's family and village punishes Edward by cutting up his face and torturing him. Julian takes Edward back to their estate in England, where he keeps him locked away because of his disfigured face and because he yells and sounds like he has PTSD from the horrible torture he has just endured in Africa. Sick of being locked up, Edward asks his crooked lawyer, Trench, Peter Arne, which is the greatest bad guy name in the universe, to help him fake his death so he can get out of this prison-like existence. The nefarious Trench enlists the help of a young African named Ngalo, Harry David, to give Edward a medicine which would make him look dead, but... Uh, it being only a temporary condition. Julian finds Edward, quote, dead, but doesn't want him lying in state where people can see what happened to his face. So he asks Trench to come up with another body to take his place, just until the viewing is over. For Pete's sakes, I cannot wrap my head around this one. How can they replace Edward with someone in a full viewing where everyone knows him. What the hell? That makes no sense. Trench and Ngalo kill someone for that purpose. Remember, Ngalo wants the cash to pay for his voyage back home, and Trench is just plain greedy and corrupt. But you know what they could have just done? They could have given the same uh, medicine or potion or whatever to that guy that they killed and then just had him appear dead and then he'll wake up and he's just fine. Yeah, that's true. And Trench, and anyway, after the viewing, they throw the new body in the river and put Edward back into the coffin and bury him. Now remember, Julian doesn't know Edward is still alive, but corrupt numbers one and two know. Enter Christopher Lee, or Dr. Newhart, his character in this movie. Oftentimes, he hires someone to dig up fresh bodies for his medical experiments. Since Edward is considered a fresh body, they dig him up. Well, Dr. Newhart discovers Edward is alive and that he wants retribution for being buried alive. <laughs> Edward ends up staying at the doctor's place and wearing some of his clothes while donning a crimson mask in front of the <laughs> servants and whenever he goes out to hide his disfigured face. Marco? Oh, you're done now? You're, you're finally done spoiling the whole movie? Yeah, just so right. You, just so you guys know, there's no point in watching the movie anymore after what Safi just said. I mean, the, the thing about him killing the kid, that's supposed to be the big twist in the movie. And then his brother learning that he was buried alive, he didn't know that. Well, those were both the biggest twists in the movie. But of course, Safi doesn't care about you guys watching the movie. She just cares about doing some sort of a weird summary where she just... Ex I, do you care to explain the rest of the movie, Safi? Oh, there's a lot more to oh, what's really, going on. Really? The movie is... This movie... I was so disappointed. Once again, like with The Irishman. This movie is a lot worse than The Irishman, though. Let's just say that this movie is amateur on the highest level. I mean, I've seen 
it, and it has nothing to do with the budget. It's $125,000 in budget. And I think most of the budget was spent on getting these uh, actors that they didn't need to get. They should have left Christopher Lee out of this movie because he was terrible in it. And he basically, I mean, he... Did he have any standout scene, Safi? Like, any scene at all where he stood out? The only scene I can think of, there was a really funny scene where the servant girl, spoiler alert, since Safi doesn't really care about spoiling things or not, uh, the servant girl goes into the Crimson Hood's bedroom, and then they start embracing each other, and then it, transition, it transitions to this next shot, where Christopher Lee slaps her in the face and, and calls her a slut or, or something like that. And, and, and that that's his only standout scene in a, in, a, in a bad way, in a funny way. Like, that's a really hilarious scene because first you're seeing her embracing this guy. And then it cuts immediately to the next day when Christopher Lee slaps her across the face. And other than that, Christopher Lee doesn't do anything in this movie. And then he gets killed. I'm just not even going to care about spoilers since Safi didn't have the courtesy to care about spoilers. And then, uh, this movie has nothing to do with the story, though. The Oblong Box story. It it actually was originally going to be called The the Man in the Crimson Hood. And I think that would have been a better title. Although, I think this movie's story is kind of garbage. I mean, I think there's a good concept... I think it's a creepy idea that you that you would uh, if it was done in a different way, like where where you had these people and and they saw that this person in a coffin, and they're like, wait a second, that's not the person. What happened to the real person? Whose body is this? What? Why did they take the body of the real person? Like that could be really creepy. They kind of did that with Phantasm where they re remember the scene where, it, or they replace all the bodies, or they, they turn them into uh, aliens, or whatever they did. They were actually doing that in Phantasm, and that was really creepy in the first one. And, and w but with this movie, I really don't have much, uh, anything good to say about it, except I liked one scene or two, and I liked Vincent Price's acting, and I love the ending. The ending was fantastic. I just forgot about the ending. Uh, I'm not going to... Well, okay, I'll just go ahead and spoil it since Safi doesn't really care. Uh, the ending, what happens is Vincent Price confronts his, uh, his, his brother uh, in the woods after he kidnapped the servant girl that he is, quote, in love with for no reason. And when he confronts him and shoots him... He, he goes to him to comfort him dying, and then his brother bites him on the hand. And then in the last scene, for some reason, Vincent Price is in his brother's old room. And then, and then his wife, who actually becomes his wife in the movie, which is another spoiler, she comes in the room and finds him. And, he's like, and she's like, what are you doing in his old room? And then he turns around. And you can see that the disfigurement has transferred to his face because of the magic. And, and he's now disfigured exactly like his brother was. And he's like, this is my room now. And, and that was my favorite scene in the whole movie. <laughs> because it, it, it was cool. And, and it was like, oh, that, that's a really good ending. That, that's, that's cool. I love, and Vincent Price's acting really took it up a notch. But Christopher Lee, he was a big disappointment. And it's funny because we hear all these interviews of Christopher Lee when he was alive talking about Dracula and how he was so upset that they didn't do Dracula like it was in the book and they didn't really adapt the book. Well, with this movie, he agreed to be in the Oblong Box and it's literally nothing like the story at all. No. And and so like what's the deal? Is is Christopher Lee a sellout or what? What do you think, Safi? Care to spoil anything else? Well, I think you've done your duty. Okay. But that's all I yeah, I think that's okay. It's 
It's really a very short movie. I think it's like an hour and a half long. I fell asleep trying to watch it three times, by the way. That's how bad it is. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> what exactly you want me to review it now? Well, well do you think that Christopher Lee did a terrible now, job? Yeah, I, I don't. I think he was just reading the lines. Yeah. And, I mean, he didn't really put any effort into they it. They gave him white hair, and <laughs> it just it's just so weird. Like, why did he need to be in this movie? If anything, they should have had Peter Cushing play the man in the Crimson Hood. Because, to me, that, that was... the Peter Cushing, he, 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 in the Frankenstein movies, he does a really good job of, of being evil. But you still like him because he's Peter Cushing. And I think that it would have been better if he was the, the brother... Because the actor who played the brother, I mean, they took his mask off, and and he looked really dopey, and he sounded really dopey throughout the movie. He did a terrible job at acting. You want to talk about, like, with the Irish man, how all the actors are, like, stumbling around, they can barely walk or do anything. This guy is even worse. I mean, he's he's terrible, and, and he's he's acting like he's in a play. Like, he's in a stage play at the local theater for uh, $5 a ticket. No. So, Sophie? Well, watching this movie, I, that, was a, that was a bad part, too, where uh, Christopher Lee just didn't... It seemed like he didn't really want to be there, that he was probably there uh, so he could actually work with Vincent Price. I don't know if they were in any other movies together. They're only in one scene together, by the way. Yeah. And and I and I picked this movie because I thought it would be Vincent Price and Christopher Lee. But the the way they made the movie, uh, it made me physically sick. Uh, the camera work right at the very beginning of the movie was comparable to a playground piece of equipment that we used to call a merry-go-round, where you spun it and jumped on. They did this at least three times in the very beginning. It was the worst, and it made me physically ill. I felt nauseated like I had motion sickness. Also, another problem with the movie was the lighting. It was horrible. It was shot 99% of the time in the dark. I couldn't watch in the day or the night and see anything. It was just very difficult to watch. I thought the story was interesting. Uh, it could have been tweaked to, uh, like, for instance, Marco mentioned the title. They should never, he said they, they originally were going to call it The Man in the Crimson Mask. Why they decided to call it the name of this book when it's nothing like the story at all. Get more people to see it. Uh, it's stupid. And I thought, I thought the actors were good. But the things I mentioned, it made me hard to watch. So if you don't have a problem with motion sickness, then you can watch the movie, well, at least try to, since it's mostly dark. No, I'm serious. This movie is sleep-inducing. Well, if you can't see it, I guess so. No, I mean, like, just the, the plot itself. Like, it's so, it's so boring. But, it's so boring until the last uh, 30 minutes. But the problems I had were the camera work in those instances, and because it made me ill. And then another thing was their idea, which it didn't make any sense. Ed, his name was Sir Edward. He was he was knighted by the Queen, so everybody <laughs> would know him in the area. That would be something really special. Be knighted by the Queen. And so they get another body to replace him in an open viewing because of his face. And they weren't going to tell anybody about his face. That's They were keeping it a secret. And keep in mind, they, they only went on a vacation to Africa. They yeah, had been living even... in this town the whole time where people could see them. So that, I, I, that just made no sense to me. I thought it was stupid. And... Uh, I thought it, it would... It, it, I thought this movie would have been where Vincent Price is the villain and where he's he's keeping him in this box his whole life or something. Like maybe he was born with a disfigurement 
and, and he locks him up in the room and no one can see him. That would have been pretty cool and creepy. But this movie is is terrible. So the lighting, the camera work, the name, and then a couple of things in the story which made no sense. Uh, remember I said that he, Sir Edward, would don this uh, crimson mask all the time, like the servants were there all the time, so he'd have this mask on at uh, Christopher Lee's place, or Dr. Newhart's, and then when the when he had this little fling with this servant girl, and you know Christopher Lee found out and he fired her, and then she left, so he goes looking for her and he goes to a bar or it's like part brothel really, and I don't. It's get called a saloon. Well, it was part brothel. Well, that's what happens in saloons, Sophie. Not really. In the wild western saloons, it would always be they would have the prostitutes downstairs and the brothels upstairs and the, and the bars downstairs. Well, so anyway, why would he be assuming she'd be a, in a saloon, in a brothel? <laughs> she she had to work. She needed money to feed herself. So she went, actually, she went looking for another job, and, she, and Marco mentioned this. She found one at a... Uh, uh, Julian's house because they needed a a person to work and so she went working there she didn't even know that they were related because she didn't know who that guy with the crimson mask really was so you know he shows up there and there's this big final thing that Marco talked about but anyway I thought that was odd too I didn't get that and then he gets with a prostitute that looks like her no, she had. I thought she had red hair, and the girl, the servant girl, had brunette hair. No, well, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, and I, I don't know. I guess since he's so old, he doesn't really know. And that's another thing too. The age gap is disgusting. By the way, yeah, it's really gross. Odd. I, it's, just... it's, it's like in uh, Vertigo, when James Jimmy Stewart is like in his late fifties, and that girl's in her twenties, like. <laughs> This guy's in his, like, 90s. He's about ready to pass no, away. he's not. He's about ready to go in his own oblong box in real life. Oh, that's silly. And, that's and not in, true. And in this movie, he's sleeping with these, like, 20-year-old girls, and that's really uh, gross. And, and, of course, that's the 60s. But... Well, anyway... Uh, and the... Well, do you want to talk about the, food, do the, the, food, the thing? food? Yeah, let's do the food thing. Okay. Well, because I because the movie made me sick right off the bat, I gave it the coconut water I drank in California last year. Instead of replenishing my electrolytes, it made me violently ill. Since traveling from Ohio to California is such a trick, I made the best out of a bad situation. And truthfully, the movie did not make me that sick. But the rapid spinning camera work occurred at the very beginning of the movie, making it difficult to watch the rest. And then uh, another thing was naming the movie The Oblong Box was a mistake because it did not resemble Edgar Allan Poe's original story at all. And I would even wonder what he would have to say about that. I don't know. I, he would hate the movie. As much as I do. Giving up that part of my review of food is simple, and I'll just refer back, and I think I did this with another movie over a year ago, but I gave it the biscuits and gravy I ate, ate in Chicago, a Chicago restaurant, which is what I call a cross between shishi fufu and bad. Nothing like biscuits and gravy, which is simple to make. I already harangued them in a travel advisory review about it, so I won't mention the name. Now, this this hotel, we have been going to this Chicago hotel for years and years. And they used to have this fantastic buffet in the center of the hotel. And it was actually like the crown jewel of the hotel. Like, oh, cool. Like, everyone gets up at breakfast and goes down to this buffet in the center of the place. And they changed it to this like really a uh, pretentious business hotel and they moved 
the restaurant up front, which no one likes, by the way. Everyone complains, and the management doesn't listen, of course. And they actually had they had really good uh, French toast. It was like a dessert type of thing where you get. I got it every day for like three days. They give you actual ice cream, a full scoops of ice cream with French toast, maple syrup. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to eat that every day for a year, or else you'll get really sick. But Sophie got these, this, quote, biscuits and gravy, and it it looked pretty good. I was considering, but it, it's weird. At every single hotel we go to, the biscuits and gravy is always ruined. Like, they never make it right anymore. I, I used to get biscuits and gravy all the time at hotels, and now I don't because they don't do it good. And it was so bad that Safi actually told the waitress to go back and tell the chef how to actually make biscuits and gravy. I mean, that, she had her little Aunt B moment, I guess you'd say. And, <laughs> and then with the coconut water, she, she instructed someone, who wasn't me, by the way, uh, she instructed someone to get her Gatorade. Right, Safi? Was yeah. it Gatorade? Yeah. And this person got her coconut water instead. And she drank it, and then about 30 minutes later, she was horribly ill. And, and But the thing is, is that this is the beauty of these food ratings, is that she got ill watching this movie, and so that's her rating. I didn't get ill watching this movie. I fell asleep multiple times, so. <laughs> but I'm giving this movie something very forgettable. Now, keep this in mind. I, this is not in my top 10 worst old movies of the year. In fact, this is much better than Subspecies overall as a movie to watch. So I give this movie... We went also to Chicago recently, and we, we went to this restaurant called North Branch Pizza and Hamburger Company. And I got, for, for the entree, which I'm not rating this movie, I got macaroni and cheese with buffalo chicken on top. Buffalo chicken tenders. And it was fantastic. It was a five-star meal. And then for dessert, I got this chocolate cake. And it was a big, thick slice of chocolate cake. And it was the opposite of five stars. It was no stars. Because... It was so bad. It tasted stale. It tasted dry. It the icing was like frozen kind of to where you you could hardly like chew it. You could hardly pick it apart with your fork. And and it had chocolate chips in the icing, which that is a pet peeve of mine with these chocolate cakes when they put chocolate chips in the in the icing. I I'm I'm beginning to hate that a lot. And 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 also, it it tasted stale. It, and not only that, but there's this taste, this certain taste that you get from, from pastries once in a while, where it has this really weird kind of oniony taste inside it for some reason. I think it's where you put too much flour or something like that. And that was a, the taste in this cake. It tasted like onions Ew. and chocolate. And it was old, too. It tasted old like it was a week old. And it was so hard to eat it. I, I it, it made me sick. It, it gave me a stomach ache. And it ruined the meal that I was loving at the moment. And that's the, that's what I give this, uh, this movie. I give it that chocolate cake because I want to forget about it. And because it was so stale and dull and forgettable and just disgusting. And, and... And you think with this chocolate cake, I'm going to get Vincent Price and Christopher Lee versus each other. But no, I'm getting the stale-ass chocolate cake from North Branch. Ugh, it was so gross. Ugh, I, I just, I want to forget about it. Let's, let's move on now. Let's just talk about a couple of little spoilers, just like one or two things. I just wanted to mention my least favorite scene in the movie was the flashback. There was a flashback where it was the whole reason why the brother got uh, punished with witchcraft. And basically it entails him riding along the countryside in Africa in the middle of nowhere. 
this mother and her son are standing on the side of the road and just standing there. And then all of a sudden the little kid starts running out into the middle of the road for some reason and the mother just stands there staring at the man because I guess because he's white and he's evil and she's black and she's the victim. Because that's what they made it seem like. Like she just didn't even care about her son running into the middle of the road because she's so busy focusing on this man riding along the middle of nowhere. And then the kid just literally stands there for, for miles, by the way. This is a long stretch of road where he sees a guy coming on the road and he just stands there. And then the guy is about to run him over, which I don't know why the guy is continuing to 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 run him over because he he saw him from far away and then he, the kid finally starts running and then the mother finally starts running uh to save her son who I guess she never cared about in the first place and that's the scene that I hated most in this movie it was so stupid and it could have been so easily fixed just the way that they shot it it was just abysmal what did you think Sophie well, it was ridiculous. Speak up, Sophie. It was ridiculous. Uh, I've lived in uh, East Africa and Tanzania, and just the whole way that everything that they did was not right and stupid. And uh, and that actually another thing about that scene was that it was actually in the light. So it's probably like one of the only. It was the only daylight scene that you could see that wasn't in the dark and then any other lit scene during the movie was in a room yeah. in, a, in a building where you know the lights no, are actually, on. that's it there was the scene near the beginning actually there are two more scenes no well, they're very the scene, small the scene at the beginning where he proposes to her and oh. they're taking a walk i guess god it was so boring and then there was another scene where uh, Rupert Davis and his dog discover the body in the river. That scene was in the light too. But yeah, this movie was just bad. My my personal favorite scene was the one where he kills the hooker. And the reason why I liked it was because I, I liked uh, how it was done. I liked the look of it, how it was this big red slash across her neck. And, and that was probably the only convincing effect in the whole movie. There were a lot of slasher kills in this movie, and they looked really cheap and fake. And I heard, actually, that they had to reshoot these scenes to avoid an R rating. Apparently, they wouldn't want an R rating. And so they had to reshoot the scenes, like with Peeping Tom, to mm. make them uh, PG. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Which, I don't know what kid would want to watch this movie. Because if, if you put this movie on for me as a kid, I would have fallen asleep. Okay, well, I think we should wrap it up now. Are you sure? Yeah, what, what movie are we going to do next, Marco? We're doing the Ghoulies series next. Ghoulies 1, 2, 3, and 4. So, goodbye, everybody. Bye. See you soon.